pull out your message notes because we're in a series, part two of a series called The Anchored Life. If you have a Bible, you can open it to the book of Acts. If you don't, that's okay because all the verses we're gonna look at today are on, um, on your outline. And Pastor Tom Holliday is here with me backstage, sitting back behind the choir, you know, as, as he did for decades, uh, often giving me a spell to you know, preach and things like that, and I just love Tom and Shondell. I've known Shondell all her life, actually. Um, <laughs> if you didn't get that joke, she's my sister, okay? So, all right. If you, if you in your life would like more confidence and less insecurity, if you in your life would like more stability and less uncertainty, you would like more peace and less negativity, less anxiety, more hope, and less negativity. You must put your trust and you must base your security in something that can never be lost, can never be taken from you, and will never change. That's the only way you'll have security and stability in your life because it anchors you. Now, there are only two things in the universe that meet that qualification. They'll never change, you can't lose them, they can't be taken from you. And they are God's love for you and God's promises to you. Everything else in your life can be lost or changed, so if you put your security in your job, you can lose your job. If you put your security in your money, you can lose your money. You can lose your health. You can lose your friends. You can lose your talent. You can lose your good looks. Some of you already have. <laughs> I certainly never did have them, so, but. You can lose your loved ones. You can lose your mind with dementia and other ways. But all that could happen in your life, and there are two things you cannot lose. You cannot lose or change God's love for you, and you cannot lose or change God's promises to you whether you know it or not. Now you know, as I travel around the world, I've been in 165 nations training leaders over the last 40 something years, and I'm often asked this question, is there anything that God cannot do? And it often surprises people when I tell them the answer is yes. Uh, actually, as you're reading through the New Testament for the next eight weeks, I hope you'll find the five times in the New Testament it says God can't do this. There are things God can't do. And the answer is, he, he cannot deny himself. He cannot act out of character. He has to be God the way he is. For instance, God is holy, so he cannot do evil. He can never do bad things in your life. God is faithful, so he cannot break an unconditional promise that he's made to you. God is righteous which means he cannot lie. God can never lie. Everything he says is the truth, which is why we can trust him completely and trust his word, the Bible completely, even in the darkest storms of life. And when God promises to give us hope, when we feel hopeless, it's the truth because his word is 100% reliable and true. Now we're calling this series Anchoring Your Life because the Bible often pictures all the problems and pressures and pain you go through in life as an ocean storm. It's a metaphor common through the Bible that these storms of problems, they batter you around like strong winds and strong waves that push you around. And God's word is seen as an anchor that stabilizes you when you're going through hell when you're going through tough times. Now let me just show you some verses that illustrate this. They're on your outline. Uh, Hebrews 6, verses 18 and 19 says this. It is impossible 
for God to lie. So we have fled to take hold of the hope offered to us. God offers you hope that we may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul. What is your soul? Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. That's your soul. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, and this anchor is strong and it is secure. Now, you probably don't know this, uh, unless you do study church history, but the anchor is actually one of the oldest symbols of the Christian faith as old as the cross. In fact, during the 300 years of persecution in the Roman uh, 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 Empire, believers used to identify themselves not with a cross, but with an anchor, based on this verse. We have this hope as an anchor for our souls. So some of you, I'm sure, in a crowd this size, um, are already going through some kind of storm right now, financial, emotional, mental, relational, some kind of storm. And the truth is, you feel beat up. You feel battered. You barely made it to church today. You, you feel worn out, you feel weary, you feel weak. How do you keep on having hope when you're in that kind of storm? You do what David did, the next verse. You focus on God's word instead of your weakness. That's what he focused on right now. The Bible says this, David says, he's going through a storm, God, my soul is weak from waiting for you to save me. Some of you have been praying, asking God to answer prayer, and it hadn't happened, and it hadn't happened, and it happened, and you go, your, your soul is, God, I'm weak. I'm barely hanging on by a thread. My soul is weak while I'm waiting for you to save me, but here's the answer. My hope is based on your word. Now, what happens when you establish God's word, this book, the Bible, as your ultimate authority and as the basis for your hope. You make it the anchor of your life. What happens when you do that? You stop drifting. You stop drifting because now you're anchored to something unchangeable and reliable. Here's what happens in your life, the next verse, Ephesians 4, verse 14. Then we shall no longer be children carried around by the waves blown about by every shifting wind. This way, that way, this way. You're just being whiplashed. We won't be that way anymore. Shifting wind of teaching. And who does this teaching? Deceitful people who lead others into error by making a lie sound like the truth. There's a lot of people like that in the world today, and they're especially on social media, making a lie sound like the truth. Now, there are three categories of things that cause you to lose hope, and we're gonna look at the antidote to all three of them today. The three things that cause you to lose hope, the big categories are this, problems that discourage you, people that disappoint you, and perceptions, that's in your own mind, that defeat you, that's your internal thoughts. Let me explain. Uh, Discouraging problems are any kind of set of circumstances that overwhelm you. I said, financially, relationally, mentally, physically, all those different ways. Some of you are facing a discouraging problem right now, and you're losing hope. It's draining out of your life. It's never going to change. It's never going to change. Disappointing people are people who let you down, and everybody in this room has been let down by somebody at different times. And disappointing people will betray you, or they will manipulate you, or they will use you for their agenda and, and drop you. Or, or they will just lie to you for their own evangelism, evan, uh, you know, advantage. But a, a lot of hopelessness, frankly, as I have counseled literally thousands of people one-on-one in my lifetime, comes from our own, what I call, distorted perspectives. And the truth is this. We're not very good at judging ourselves. I suck at judging me. You do too. I can't see the forest for the tree. I'm not a good judge of me, and you aren't either. That's why we need other people in our lives, because we don't always see things as they really are. We often tell ourselves that things are better than they really are, and often tell ourselves things are worse than they really are. Now, 
that creates confusion and flip-flopping and doubting in, in your mind. The Bible says it like this in James chapter one, verse six. Look up here on the screen. A doubtful mind is as unsettled, and here's that metaphor again, as a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. Now, if you've got uh, notes, I want you to circle three words. The word unsettled, the word driven, and the word tossed. Would you do that right now? Circle the word unsettled, driven, and tossed. Because that's the three things that describe you when you're not anchored to God's word. If you're not anchored to God's word, when your ship's in a storm and you're about to shipwreck, your mind will be unsettled, you'll be driven to overwork, you're driven, and your emotions will be tossed back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Some of you are feeling these right now. Now, there are three common causes for these feelings. And I, I, I'm gonna talk to you about them today. First, why do we lose hope? Number one, n one big reason, we lose hope, you lose hope, when your identity is unclear. What do I mean by that? You ask yourself questions like you're wondering, who in the world am I? What am I? Why am I like this? Those are questions of identity. Who am I, what am I, why am I like this? The second reason you lose hope is not just uh, uh, unclear identity, but undefined purpose. When your purpose is undefined. And on that situation, you're asking, what on earth am I here for? What's my purpose? What's my life mission? What am I supposed to be doing with my life? If you don't know the answer to that question, hope drains out of you. And third, you lose hope when your future is uncertain. We're gonna talk about all three of these. And you're going, what's gonna happen to me? How is this all gonna end? Am I actually gonna make it through this situation? Now today, I wanna show you the antidotes from the Bible and the solutions from God's word and answer those three questions with God's word. The first, we're gonna sing a song. So everybody stand, let's sing a song. Come on, church, let's worship together. Let's respond to the goodness of our God who loves us so much. And all we can bring him is just maybe a broken hallelujah today, but that's enough. He deserves it, so let's sing this. All my words fall short. I've got nothing new. How could I express? I could sing these songs as I often do, but every song must end, and you never. Come on, let's lift it up. So I throw my hands and praise you again and again, because all that I have is a heart. Sing to him. I've got one response inside. I've got just
Sit down. Now, during this eight-week series on Anchored Life, uh, already most of you, over 17,000, have already signed up to sign through the New Testament. Uh, the rest of you are going to sign up today, right? Okay. All we need is to get 3,000 more to get over the 20,000 mark, and that's our goal. Let me just tell you about this. The New Testament is not that long. The average New York Times paper on the weekend has more words in it than the New, than the New, York New Testament. I know a lot of people think nothing of buying the New, uh, New York Times weekend, sitting in the backyard Sunday afternoon and reading the whole thing. Now, this week, we're gonna be reading three really fascinating books. The Book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, which is the story of what happens after Jesus resurrects and goes back to heaven and how the church grows. And then the two short letters written by Paul to the church in the city of Thessalonica. That's a city in northern Greece. By the way, today, 2,000 years later, Thessalonica is the second largest city in Greece. Over a million people there. It's a real place with real people. Nobody has made this thing up. Now, most of the books in the New Testament are named after the city or the area that the letter or the book was written to. For instance, um, to the Christians in Rome, uh, that letter, it's called the Book of Romans. Uh, to the, the two letters that were written to a church in Corinth, another city in Greece, they're called First and Second Corinthians. Um, if Paul had written to us, we would have gotten First and Second Californians. <laughs> now, to give you a sneak, so what I'm saying is, you see a book, Philippians, that's the people who live in the city of Philippi. Galatians, it's the people who live in the city of, or the area of called Galatia. That's what those names mean. Now, we're going to give you a preview of the three books you're going to read this week, Acts and First and Second Thessalonians, because from now on in this outline, every single verse is from either Acts or First and Second Thessalonians. So you're going to read the verses that I'm giving you today the rest of this week. Now, let me just say it like this. Just like you, I've experienced a lot of pain in my life. A lot of problems, a lot of tragedies, a lot of uh, uh, difficulties, traumas, as well as, as a pastor, I've helped a lot of other people through a lot of chaos and, and through a lot of traumas. I've seen the dark side of the pain in this world. And over in my 70 years, I have seen how messed up lives can get. So today, on my 70th birthday, uh, what I want to do is I want to share with you the three things that have kept me going no matter what happens for the past 70 years, that have kept me hopeful, kept my life filled with hope. 
And I hope you'll write down these life lessons because I had to learn them the hard way and I want you to learn them the easy way. I'm gonna tell you, all right? Now, here are the three ways you live with hope for the rest of your life, no matter what happens and you don't know what's gonna happen. Number one, I must anchor my identity to what God says about me. Write that down. I must anchor my identity to what God says about me. Not what your friends say, your social media say, your parents say, uh, your spouse says, people at work say, what God says about you. Now, did you know that God planned every single detail of your life? Every single detail. He custom designed you. There's nobody like you in the whole world. God made you to be you. He doesn't want you to be anybody else. When you get to heaven, God's not gonna say, why weren't you more like Moses? Why weren't you more like Rick? Because everybody should be like me. <laughs> now, this week, you're gonna read this verse when you read the book of Acts. Here's what it says, Acts 17, verse 26 and 28. From one man, God created all races, which means racism is a sin, because we all came from the same guy anyway, his name's Adam. From one man, God created all races of people on earth, and race is not a skin problem, it's a sin problem, it's racism. So it says, from one man, God created all races of people on earth, and he determined the exact times, circle that, the exact time set for each of us, and the exact places where each of us would live. Circle that, exact places. His purpose was that in all of this was so that all people would reach out for him and find him, because he is not far from any one of us. For in him, talking about God, we live and move and have our being. Now notice what that verse says. It says that it, in all of history, God chose you and to create you to be here and now. Not in the Middle Ages, not in another country. He chose your parents. They may have not known that you were gonna be born, but he chose them because he wanted you to be you. If God had not wanted to create you, you would not exist. Now why did God create you? I've told you this hundreds of times. God made you to love you, to love you. The only reason you are alive is God is a God of love and he created you to love you. If God had not wanted to love you, you wouldn't take your next breath. You would not exist. In him we live and move and have our being. Every breath you take comes as a gift from God. Now, God loves you so much, you can't make him stop loving you. The verse 1 Thessalonians, that we're gonna look at that book this week, verse four, chapter one, verse four. We know that God loves you. We know that God loves you and has chosen you to be his own. It's a privilege to be chosen by God. Remember when they were choosing teams and you go, oh, I hope I'm not the last one chosen? You weren't with God. Now on your outline, I have listed just a few, just a few of the thousands of things God says about you in this book. You don't even know what God has said about you. That's why you gotta read the book. Now, I wish I had time to read all of the verses for even just these few that I listed, but we don't have time to do that. But here's what God says about you, and listen close. God says, number one, you are valuable. You have infinite worth. He made you. He says you're valuable. God says you are acceptable. Other people may not accept you, but God says, I accept you. You are chosen, God chose to make you. You are loved and you are lovable. I mean, I'm not lovable. Yes, you are. The creator of the universe loves you. God says you are forgiven, no matter what you've done. If you just come and say, God, I'm sorry, I, I, forgive me. You are forgiven. God says you are capable. I don't care what the teachers or coaches or parents or anybody else said about you, you are capable. You are worth dying for. Jesus' death on the cross proves it. I love you this much. The Bible says you are unforgettable in the book of Isaiah. God says I've engraved you on the palms of my hands. Did you know that God has a tattoo of you? It's the nail scars from hanging on the cross. He said I did this 
for you. That's how much I love you. Now listen, why is that important? Because psychology uh, has discovered that your self-worth, how, how you feel about yourself, your self-worth tends to be based on what you think the most important people in your life think about you. Let me say that again. You tend to feel about yourself, your self-worth, what you think the most important people in your life think about you. That's how you get your self-worth. If that's true, I highly suggest and recommend that you make Jesus Christ the most important person in your life. And you start listening to what he says about you, not what everybody else says about you. So, how do you know your true value? What is your value? How valuable are you as a person? I'm not talking about your net worth. I'm talking about your self-worth as a person. How valuable are you as a person? Well, I now know how to measure value and worth. Because Kay and I watch a show called Antique Roadshow. <laughs> Have any of you seen this show, Antique Roadshow? People bring in their junk and they say it's worth this much or it's worthless or it's worth 10,000 or a million bucks. You go, whoa, look at that, I never imagined that. I learned from that the three things that create value. If you wanna know how valuable you are, here's the three things. Number one, who created it? If I show you a painting, the value is based on, was it painted by Rick Warren or by Michelangelo? <laughs> Who created it determines the value of something. The second thing is, what are people willing to pay for it? You got a house, you got a car, you think you can sell it for so much, you know what your house is worth? Not what you think it's worth. It's worth what somebody's willing to pay for it, and that's it, not one penny more. What, what people are worth, willing to pay for it. Number three, determines value is who owns it. I have a guitar. Taylor Swift has a guitar. Hers is more valuable than mine. Because it's hers. Now let's just apply those three things to you. Who created you? God did. God created you and custom designed you. He made you. Your heavenly father made you. That shows your value. Second, what, what are you worth? What is people willing to pay for it? Jesus came and gave his life for you. God sent his son to die for you. That's the ultimate price. That's how valuable you are. The cross says you matter this much to God. Jesus says, I'd rather die than live without you. I, I, I love you so much, every drop of blood coming down from his body on the cross was saying, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. And who owns you? You may think you own yourself, but your creator owns you. You're owned by God, and he puts his spirit in you. That shows infinite value. Now, by the way, I'd like to pause right here and ask you to pray uh, for the controversial British comedian and actor, uh, Russell Brand. Some of you know who I'm talking about. He was married to Katy Perry for a while. Um, this week, I got emails from literally all around the world from people sending me a video that Russell posted on Twitter, now, now X, where he says he's considering Jesus and that he has been reading the Bible and Rick Warren's Purpose Driven Life. Um, so, now that's not surprising to me because when ce celebrities get in trouble or go to jail, they take Purpose Driven Life, okay? <laughs> I got a long, OJ took the Purpose Driven Life to prison. Paris Hilton took Purpose Driven Life to prison. El Chapo took Purpose Driven, I got a picture of El Chapo walking into prison. Number one drug lord in the world carrying Purpose Driven Life. It's the great antidote if you go in the, in the slammer, okay? <laughs> anyway, uh, Russell, uh, it's, a great, it's a great video, I watched it, by a true seeker. You need to pray for him. but. At the end of the video, I'm going, oh, no, no, don't, don't say that, Russell, because he says, now, I want all of you to tell me what you think. And I'm going, Russell, no, 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 because honestly, a thousand opinions of other people is the last thing Russell needs. He just needs to focus on what God says about him, not what we say about him, okay? And the problem with celebrities is one minute you're the hero, and the next minute you're a zero, 
Okay, today you're on the cover of Rolling Stone, tomorrow you're a nobody. Now, the same is true for you. You need to tune out all the other voices in your life when it comes to who you are, your identity. You need to stop listening to the voices of your past. You need to stop listening to the voices of your parents. You need to stop listening to the voices of your friends, the people you work with, uh, the media, and especially you need to ignore social media. And just listen to what God says about you. Because ultimately, friend, there's only one person in the universe you actually have to please. That's your creator. And what he says about you is always the truth because God cannot lie. Now listen, if you struggle with confusion over your identity, who you are, your racial identity, your sexual identity, uh, your, any other kind of identity, my prayer for you is from the book we're gonna read this week, 2 Thessalonians chapter three, it's verse five, it says this. May the Lord bring you into an ever deeper understanding of the love of God and the endurance that comes from Christ. When you lose hope, you don't have any endurance. You just wanna give up. You just wanna crawl in bed and die. A few years back, uh, the singer Lauren Daigle wrote a song about anchoring your life in God's word. That's what I'm talking about in this first point. What God says about you. That song stayed at number one on Billboard's Christian songs for 113 weeks. That song sold six million copies. It won the Grammy for song of the year of Christian songs. I want you to listen to it because I think it says better than what I've been trying to say to you about anchoring your, your, your identity in what God says about you. Listen to this.
victory. Thanks, Sean. Okay, did you get that point? All right. Now, to live with hope, no matter what happens, the first thing you have to do is you have to anchor your identity in what God says about you, not what everybody else says. Now, here's the second thing. Next, I must anchor my life mission to God's purpose for me. God doesn't just love you, he has a purpose for your life. I anchor my mission to God's purpose for me. Now God has never made anything without a purpose. Every plant has a purpose, every animal has a purpose, every rock has a purpose, and if you're breathing, God has a purpose for your life. My ver life verse that I base my life on actually comes out of this book. It's Acts chapter 13, verse 36. I think, it's not a really long verse, it's the simplest explanation and definition of true success. In fact, I would like Acts 13, 36 put on my tombstone. So somebody remember that, please, okay? Some of you old people will die before I do, but that's okay. Uh, you know, the rest of you. It, it, Acts 13, 36 says this. David served God's purpose in his generation, then he died. I love that. He served God's purpose in his generation, then he died. That's the definition of success, for you to serve God's purpose in your generation, then you die. He did that which never changes God's purpose in his generation, in a world that's constantly changing. He did the timeless in a timely way. He did that which never changes in a world that's always changing. He did that which is eternal in a contemporary way. He served God's purpose in his generation, then he died. Who wants to stay around here anyway after God's finished with your purpose? I don't. I want to go to heaven. Now, I want to live forever. Don't get me wrong. I want to live forever, just not here. I don't want to live. I'd, to live forever in a world full of sorrow, suffering, sickness, sadness, stress, that's called hell. Okay? I want to live forever. I just don't want to, I want to live in a perfect place where there's no pain, no problems, no pressure, all peace. Everything works great. No bills. So I want to serve God's purpose in my generation. And when God's through with me, I'm going to die. And when you're serving God's purpose in your generation, honestly, you're indestructible till God's finished with you. Now, thank you, sister. All right. Now, let me just get real personal and in your face, because you know I love you. You know I love you. I've loved you for decades. The truth is, you weren't created to live for yourself. You're not a big enough reason to get out of bed. Really. Put your hand in a bucket, bucket of water and take it out and see the difference you made. You were made for a mission, something far greater than yourself. You were made for God's purpose, God's mission for your life. This is the fifth of the five purposes for your life. We've got classes on each of them here at Saddleback. Class one, two, class three, class four. I'm teaching you stuff that you can finish taking in class four, class 401, discovering my life mission. 
Now what is that life mission? We got a whole class on it. I could spend six months teaching you about it. But one of the things that's part of your life mission is this. It's part of your life mission to bring other people to heaven with you. You're going to heaven because somebody told you. Have you ever told anybody else? Is anybody going to heaven because of you? That is the greatest accomplishment you will ever have in your life. Help somebody settle their eternal destiny. Everything else you do in this life will be forgotten before 100 years is over. But if you help somebody get into heaven, they're gonna be thanking you forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Have you ever told your story to anybody else? You could be the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, and if nobody's gonna be in heaven because of you, nobody's gonna remember your corporation. Acts 20, 24, the next verse on your outline is Kay's, one of her life verses. And it, Paul says this, I don't care about my own life. The most important thing that I do is that I complete my mission, the work that the Lord Jesus gave me. And then he tells what's part of that mission, to tell people the good news about God's grace. I love the, I, I've memorized this verse in lots of different translations. In the NIV translation it says, I want to complete my race and I want to finish the task that I was given. Would you circle that phrase, finish the task? Since I replaced myself and Kay, we replaced ourselves with Andy and Stacy to lead Saddleback Church, I've been le busy the last uh, years leading the largest coalition of Christians and churches all around the world to complete the great commission of Jesus Christ in the next 10 years by the 2000th anniversary of Christianity. I can't talk to you all about it right now, but that global movement that I lead is called Finishing the Task. And uh, I need to come back and tell you about it uh, some, sometime soon. But let's get back to your mission. Listen real closely. The only way you're ever gonna complete your life mission, the mission that God made you for, is you gotta pay more attention to the word than you do to the world. That's the only way you're ever gonna know your life mission. You gotta be in this book every day. Pay more attention to the word than the world. You need to spend less time in Facebook and more time with your face in this book. So let me ask you a very pointed question. This is gonna tell me a lot about you. What do you read about the most? Social media, are you kidding me? What do you listen to the most? What do you talk about the most? That's gonna tell me what your life mission is. You know, today, Christians talk more about politics than they do about Jesus. They worry more about their nation than they worry about God's kingdom. Now, I don't wanna to be too hard on you, because even the very first disciples, the original 12, they fell for this trap too, before they were anchored in God's word. In fact, you probably don't know this, but the very last conversation that the 12 disciples had with Jesus before he went back to heaven, uh, they asked him a question, and it was a political question. You, know what, you wanna know what the question was? Here it was. Uh, Lord, when are you gonna make our nation great again? I'm not kidding you. You're gonna read about it this week. Are you kidding me? That is human nature. Lord, when are you gonna make our nation great again? That's the last question the disciples asked Jesus before he, he ascends back to heaven. Jesus had, had, had to rebuke them gently. Okay, it's human nature. And he had to rebuke them gently and say, guys, guys, guys. Um, this is not something I want you worrying about. I have a far bigger purpose for your life. I have a far greater important mission for your life. 
that I want you and anybody who calls himself a Christian and all who follow me and all of the children in my family, I want them to follow. And here is the big mission. I want you to take the good news about my love for everybody and my grace and forgiveness for everybody and my free salvation for everybody. I want you to take that message to the whole world. I want you to make the gospel, that means good news, global. Now, the book of Acts that you're gonna read this week, it begins with that conversation that I just told you. It's in Acts chapter one, verses six to eight. Let me read it to you. Up here on the screen it says, the disciples asked Jesus, uh, Lord, when are you gonna restore the kingdom to Israel? When are you gonna make our nation great again, like it was in the time of King David? We're just a, we're a de declining nation right now. When are you gonna restore the, when are you gonna make our nation great again? Now Jesus replies pretty bluntly, uh, guys, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set. In other words, it's none of your business and I don't want you thinking about it. He says, that's not what I put you here on earth for. And he then flips the conversation from politics and starts talking about their life mission. And he says, don't worry about that stuff. But here's what I want you worried about. When the Holy Spirit comes to you, you're going to receive my power. I'm going to give you my power. And then you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea uh, and in Samaria and in every part of the world. Now, I want you, this is a very important scripture for your life mission. So I want you to notice three things about it. First, Jesus flips the conversation, as I said, uh, from politics to what was really more important, taking the good news of Jesus to the whole world. This is gonna shock you. Jesus Christ never said one single thing about national politics. Not one. In fact, he once told the politician, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my followers would fight. My followers would fight for it. It's not our battle, you guys. There are gonna be enormous battle this next year during election years. It's not our battle. My kingdom is not of this world. Jesus did not come to save America or any other nation. He came to save the whole world. He came to save people. All right? Now, number two. I'm just trying to help you get your priorities right so Jesus won't say to you when you stand before him one day, what in the world were you thinking? You waste all your time and energy writing and talking and blogging about that instead of my good news? Second thing it says in that verse, he says, you will be my what? Did anybody read it? You will be my witnesses. Now, listen real closely. Your mission, part of your mission for Jesus is to be a witness for Jesus, not a lawyer. Let me explain the difference. In a court case, the witness just comes in, sits on the thing, and tells what they experienced. I saw this, I saw that, that's it, thanks, you're excused. A lawyer's job is to press for a decision and get people to make a commitment. Did, Jesus didn't say, you'll be my lawyers. He said, you're to be my witness. What does witness mean? You just tell what happened to you. That's it. That's all God expects you, tell what happened to you. And guess what, you're the authority on that. Nobody else can share your testimony. Nobody else can be your witness. If you don't be the witness God made you to be, then nobody's gonna hear your story. You don't have to memorize a single Bible verse to be a witness. Here's what God did for me. God is good, God is faithful. God helped me in this, Christ helped me in this, I did this, here's how my life has changed. That's what a witness does. Anybody can do that. You don't have to be a Bible scholar, you just tell your story and guess what? You're the authority on you, nobody can challenge that. The third thing this verse says is that Jesus gives you four targets for your mission and for your witness on earth. He says, first, uh, you're to start where you live. Share your story where you live. Now these guys lived in Jerusalem, so he says start in Jerusalem. Wherever you live, he says, start sharing your story wherever you live. And then he says, you're also to witness to people in your state, that's Judea. Judea was like the territory province around Jerusalem. 
And then he says, also, you're to witness to people who aren't like you. That's called Samaria. Samaritans lived with the Jews, but they weren't Jews. You know anybody who's not like you on your block? Of course you do. We're in Southern California. We speak 196 languages. We are a cosmopolitan, multicultural. Uh, California is a minority a state. Nobody's a majority in this state. And so we, we live in Samaria. We, we live with people unlike us, racially, sexually, politically, um, in every area. And then he says, by the way, you're also to take the good news to the whole world. And guess what? You're the first generation who can actually do that because we have a thing called the internet. Are you familiar with this? You can sit in your PJs in your bedroom and be a witness all around the world. Other generations couldn't do that. Now, how do you get started on your life mission, taking somebody to heaven with you? Well, you start by praying, and you ask God to give you the courage to share your story. Now, your story is called a testimony, and you share it with other people. Now, notice this verse in Acts chapter one, verse 14. On the screen it says, the apostles had a single purpose as they devoted themselves to prayer. That's where you start for your, God, give me the courage to share my story, what happened to me, how God has been good to me. And they were joined, it says, by some women. Now, isn't that a little strange, why they add that in there? The apostles are praying and they're joined by some women? Let me tell you why that's not strange. Because um, before Jesus sent his spirit to live inside all of us, and that started on the first day of the church called the day of Pentecost. Only the apostles, by the way, who happened to all be men, preached the good news, shared the good news, gave a witness, gave a testimony, talked about the Lord, shared their story, there's a, evangelized, there's a million different words for it. Uh, only they, and they were all men, but the day of Pentecost changed everything. And Peter, in his sermon on the first day of the church, announced, that the last days were beginning with the coming of the Holy Spirit. People ask me all the time, Pastor Rick, are we in the last days? I'll tell you, we've been in the last days for 2,000 years. We're in the later of the latter of the last days. Okay, we don't know how many more there are behind us or in front of us, but we're certainly a lot closer than they were. we're too, but the last days actually started when everything changed, when God put his spirit in everybody, young and old, men and women, everybody. And now everybody gets to share. So everybody gets to preach and proclaim. Women, men, children, old. Let me read it to you. Here's what it says. Acts chapter, um, oh, look here on the screen. 2, verse 17, 18. Peter says, this is the first day of the church. In the last days, and he goes, we're, you know, we're in it. That's why you're seeing this happening, because women were preaching at Pentecost. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on all my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. What's prophesy? Just another word for preach, proclaim, witness, tell, share your testimony. Expose other people. It's, it's just a word that means to communicate. That's all it means, to communicate the good news. And he says in that verse, if you circle it, sons and daughters will preach, young and old, men and women. Who does that leave out? Nobody. We all get to play in the game now. In the Old Testament, you had to be an ordained male to preach and share the word of God. You had to be an ordained male. And you actually had to be from the tribe of Levi. I couldn't have been doing what I'm doing right now in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, everybody is, you have the same spirit of God in you that's in me and in Andy Wood and in Stacy Wood. You have as much right to preach as I do. You're no different. I don't have more of God's spirit than you do. I have the same amount, we all have the same amount of God's spirit in all of us. But only you can give your testimony. So, right now, I want you to practice your testimony. And what we're gonna do, is we're gonna stand and we're gonna sing how good Jesus has been to you. 
Okay, everybody stand up. We're gonna sing the goodness of God. This is a testimony song. So when you sing it, it's your first testimony. All right, let's sing it. Come on out, guys. I'm gonna be here with you. these words together.
uh, when you, as you sit down, I want you to say to the next person to, next to you, nice testimony. Okay, just turn around. Nice testimony. <laughs> nice testimony. Okay, nice, nice testimony. Be seated. All right. Now, let me just say this. You can sing it in church. Can you say it to a friend? Can you tell a friend who doesn't know about how good God is, that he's been good to you? That's a witness. And God has called that to be part, it's not all, part of your life mission. Now, let's go to the third thing that anchors your life so you're stable in all the storms of life. To live with hope, you don't have any idea what's gonna happen to you the rest of your life. None of us do. To live with hope, no matter what happens, number one, I must anchor my identity in what God says about me. Number two, I must anchor my life mission in God's purpose for me. And number three, I must anchor my future to God's promises to me. Write that down. I must anchor my future to God's promises to me. Now, when you have an insurance policy, that insurance policy promises to care for a bunch of stuff so you don't have to pay for it. And you don't worry about the things that are covered in the insurance policy because the company promises to cover those costs. There are 6,000 insurance promises in this book from God, and he doesn't weasel out on it and say, well, we're not going to pay that. There are 6,000 promises. You don't even know them. Let me say it another way. When you are reading a novel or you're watching a movie uh, and you know how a mystery ends, you don't get uptight and anxious about the scary parts of the story because, you know, I know how it ends. And you relax and you don't worry about it. If you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ and you've trusted him for his, your eternal salvation, because you certainly can't save yourself, even though you don't know what's going to happen in the rest of your life, and you don't, you don't know the ups and the downs, you don't know the highs and the lows that you're going to go through, you already know the ending. And the ending is this. When you die, God is going to resurrect you to heaven because Jesus made that possible for you to do and God promised to do it and God cannot lie. Let me show you a couple verses in the book you're going to read this week, the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2, verse 25 to 27. Peter, quoting David, says this. I know the Lord is always with me, so I will not be shaken. No matter what people do to me, circumstances do to me, I'm not moved, I'm not shaken. I can have an earthquake in my life, but I know the Lord is always with me, so I will not be shaken, his presence and his promises, for he is right beside me. And then he says, my body rests in hope. My body rests in hope because God will never leave me in the grave. What's he talking about? He's talking about your resurrection. You're not going to stay in your grave. God is going to resurrect you if you accept his gift of salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. This is why 2.6 billion people, Christians in the world, celebrate Easter every year. Because Easter says the grave isn't the end of the story. Death isn't the end of the story. It's just a transition. And so we celebrate Easter because when Jesus defeated death, he defeated it for all of us. Now, I feel that way. I have that hope. You have that hope. Paul says the same thing in Acts chapter 24, verse 15. He has the same hope that I do, the same hope that Peter has. Notice what he says. I have the same hope in God that they have, the hope that all people, hello, wait a minute, all people, good and bad, will surely be raised from the dead. Some of you go, huh? What are you talking about, Rick? Everybody's going to be raised from the dead? Let me explain this. Every human being, good, bad, or ugly, is created in the image of God. Every human being, good, bad, or ugly, is loved by God. Every human being, good, bad, or ugly, has a purpose from God. But not every human being has a, is in God's family. You have to choose to be in God's family through trust. But in every human being, you have an immortal soul. Every human being has an immortal soul, which means they're made by God 
to last forever. So everybody's going to be resurrected after they die. The difference is where you spend eternity after you're resurrected. Everybody's going to live for eternity. Nobody stays in the grave. It's not the end. It's just where you live after you're resurrected. And depending on your choice here on earth, you will either in eternity live with God forever, with God forever, or without God forever. Now we call living with God forever in eternity, we call that heaven. To live forever in eternity without God, that would be called hell, friends. And that's a big difference. Now the choice is yours. God doesn't send people to heaven or hell. You choose to go to either one. So I'm recommending you make the right choice because friend, frankly, somebody who loves you, let me just be honest with you, eternity is a long time to be wrong. You better make the right choice. You wanna live with God forever or you wanna live without God forever? It's your choice. God's not gonna force you to love him. Now in 1 first, first Thessalonians, you're gonna read this book, chapter four, we get a few more details. Verse 13 and 14. We want you to know the truth about believers who've died so that you will not grieve as those who have no hope. Christians grieve the people who die in our lives. We, don't, we grieve with hope. It's a different kind of grief. I've seen it between, done hundreds and hundreds of funerals. We know that Christ died. Jesus died and rose back to life again. So because of him, we also know that God raises those who have died believing in him. What does this mean? It means that at funerals of people who know the Lord, who've accepted the salvation through what Christ did for us on the cross, we don't grieve for people who've died at their funeral if they know the Lord. We grieve for ourselves. We're not grieving for them. They're in heaven. They're where we're all going to be. I've got a bunch of friends in heaven. Rick Muchow, Glenn Cruen, Steve Rutenbar, John Baker. These were pastors who helped me build this church for decades. They're all in heaven. They beat me to heaven. I hate them for that. <laughs> but they're already there. No problem, no pain, no you know, suffering, no sorrow, no sadness, no sickness. So we don't grieve for the people who know the Lord who die, but we grieve for ourselves because we're going to miss them. And we're going to miss them until we are united again in heaven. That's our loss. We lose them here on earth. We don't lose them for eternity. What I'm trying to teach you is that if you'll anchor your life in the word of God, you won't be afraid of death. I had my brush with death last September. Out of the blue, I had a heart attack. I was standing in my living room about nine o'clock at night, and all of a sudden it felt like a railroad train was going through my chest. And I fell over backwards uh, on the sofa. Okay, immediately called the ambulance. They got there within seconds. There were four ambulance guys. They walked in and they go, it's Pastor Rick. <laughs> Three of the four guys had read Purpose Driven Life. Kay goes, all right, fanboys, this isn't a time for hugs and autographs. All right, just get my husband to the hospital. Within minutes, we're at Mission Hospital. Now, I, I know everybody at Mission. I've been a pastor. I've visited every room there for 44 years. I know half the staff, a third of the, church, uh, the staff there go to Saddleback Church. So but then quickly, I'm in the operating room. I'm stark naked, laying on a, uh, on a steel table, bright lights, six people around me, three women, three men, a woman shaving my body, preparing me for surgery. There's no glory in that. It's like, hey, looking good, Pastor Rick. How you doing? You know, looking good. You know, I just, there, there's no, it's just total vulnerability. And uh, I had enough sense of mind to say to them, uh, guys, if any of you happen to take any pictures, I'll be happy to autograph them after this is over. <laughs> One of the doctors said, Pastor Rick, uh, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. <laughs> I had a very profound experience with the Lord wondering if I was gonna die at that moment. It'd take me about half an hour to share it with you. I'm not gonna share that, but I will tell you this part. I'm laying on this steel bed, awaiting surgery, 
not knowing if I'm going to make it or not. And I am totally at ease. I'm not worried. I'm not fearful. I'm not scared. I'm not anxious. I'm not threatened. I'm totally at peace. I've been walking with Jesus Christ most of my life, over 50 years. He's my best friend. I know, I've been knowing where I was going for a long, long time. I'm not afraid to die. So there was no fear in my life. And I said this to the Lord as I'm laying there naked, uh, waiting surgery. I said, Lord, you know my life verse is he served God's purpose in his generation and then he died. Lord, to the best of my ability, I've done that. I have served your purpose in my generation. And if this is the time for me to die, it's okay with me. I've been preparing for it all my life. It's okay with me. That wouldn't be okay with Kay or my kids or my grandkids, but it's okay with me. And if after this surgery, I don't wake up here, I wake up in heaven, it's fine. But Lord, if I do wake up here on earth, it means you're not through with me. You still have more. You've got Rick Warren 2.0. You got Rick, the second act, finishing the task. And I'll know what you've called me to do. At that moment, there was no blinding light, no music, no angels came down and flapped. But I felt totally enveloped with love. It's hard to explain the joy to feel the unconditional love of God laying there naked in an operating room. And I just felt enraptured by God's love as they gave me the anesthesia and I went under. Nine hours later, I woke up and I looked around and saw all these tubes and things. Yeah, this ain't heaven. <laughs> so you get Rick 2.0, okay? All right, that, that's, what it is, that's what it is. So. Now, I tell you that story because I don't want you to be afraid of death. Honestly, when you're not afraid of death, I'm fearless. I'm fearless, really. Because if they can't kill you, and if they kill you, you win anyway, who do you, what do you care about what critics say? Or anybody else? I want you to live a fearless life, but it'll only happen if you're anchored to the word of God. Now, how are you to face whatever days you have left on earth? Well, here's what the Bible says. God says that life on this world, he says everything in this world is broken because of sin. Broken economy, broken weather, everything's broken. And so we live in a broken world, uh, life is a daily battle. Everybody agree with that? Life is a daily battle, it's hard, okay? Some days life sucks. It's hard. And God says when you're in a battle, a spiritual battle, you're gonna need spiritual armor for protection. So what is spiritual body armor that protects you spiritually when you're in the battles uh, in, in the world? The spiritual armor are attitudes. They are the attitudes of faith and hope and love. Faith and hope and love. There, as I said, there are over 6,000 promises from God in this book. And he wants you to trust those promises so you can face your future with faith and with hope and with love. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, we're getting down here to the end, says this. We should wear faith and love as a breastplate to protect us and hope, the hope of salvation, should be our helmet. Now what does a breastplate do in a soldier? It protects his or her heart. And what does a helmet do? It protects his or her mind. The two most important things in your body are your heart and your mind. And he says spiritually, you need faith and love in your heart and you need hope in your mind. And that's the breastplate and that's the helmet for you to battle in the world. Does that make sense? Faith and hope in your heart and hope, faith and love in your hope, hope in your brain. If you don't know God's promises, your mind is unprotected. Satan can throw any kind of fear he wants to into your mind. He can throw any kind of anxiety, any kind of depression into your mind. Any, he can throw any kind of insecurity and inadequacy 
and loneliness into your mind. Now, in your Bible reading this week, you're going to read the dramatic story of St. Paul's shipwreck in the Mediterranean Sea. It's Acts chapter 27. Um, I'm not going to tell you the ending of the story, but they ought to make a movie about this, this story. It's pretty exciting. But if you're feeling hopeless about your future, you definitely need to read Acts 27 this week. And when you do, circle the five times the word anchor is used in that chapter, because we're talking about the anchored life. Now, some of you today, I'm sure, feel the way Paul felt when he's going through this terrible storm in the Mediterranean Sea, and the ship was falling apart. And it says in verse 20, it says this. Look at this on the screen. For many days, we couldn't see either the sun or the stars. Some of you are in this right now. You're in the dark. I can't see the sun in the day. I can't see the stars at night. I, I'm totally in the dark. I have no idea how I'm going to get out of the situation I'm in right now. You're in the dark. And it says the storm would not let up. Some of you are in this right now. The pain I'm in is relentless. It will not go away. The mental pain, the emotional pain, the financial pain, it will not go away. It was so severe, Paul says, that we finally began to lose all hope of coming out of it alive. Some of you are in like that today. I'm not gonna get out of this. I'm going under for the last time. I'm, I'm going under. Then, a few verses later, after Paul says that, in verse 40, it tells us they, quote, cut loose the anchors of that ship that's coming apart in this storm. And it says they, quote, began to drift. Friends, that's always what happens in your life if you're not anchored, if you're not anchored, you start drifting. If you're not anchored to anything, you, you, some of you have been drifting your entire life because you haven't been anchored to anything. Some of you have been drifting for weeks or months. Friends, it's time to stop drifting. You need to anchor yourself to the rock, the truth of God's who created you, the creator who made you and who loves you and who sent Jesus to die for you. Now listen, filling your mind every day, reading a little bit of God's word every day will give you the faith and the love and the hope you need to defeat all the thoughts that right now are defeating you. Thoughts of discouragement, I can't do it. Thoughts of dread, I'm scared to death. Thoughts of disappointment, my heart is broken. Thoughts of depression, I can't move. Thoughts of, of despair, I feel like giving up, taking my life. Some of you may be in such bad shape right now, you're saying, Rick, I'm already shipwrecked. In fact, the ship has already fallen apart. I'm holding on to driftwood and I'm, I'm fishing around in the ocean. And I'm about to go under. And I am too wounded and I'm too tired and I'm too young or too old or too broken for God to bless and to use in my future. I want you to listen to me as somebody who loves you. You're dead wrong. You are dead wrong. You need to start reading all the promises of God in his book every day. Tasha Layton has written a song called Never. I love this song. Because God says over and over in Scripture, I will never, 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 never leave you or forsake you. I will never stop loving you. I will never not be with you. And in her song, Never, she has a sign that's a line that says, There's not a broken, too broken for God. There's not a broken, too broken for you. Listen to this, and I'll come back and close. This broken world has broken me down When my tears and knees both fall to the ground When my questions make me doubt you more than ever You remind me that your answer's always never Never forgotten, never forsaken Thank you.
Thank you. Would you bow your heads with me? I want to pray for you, but I want to lead you in a prayer first. If you have been drifting without God, whether weeks, months, or your entire life, this is your day. It's your lucky day. I invite you to follow me in this prayer. You don't have to say it aloud. You don't even have to close your eyes. God knows exactly what you're thinking. He's known every thought you've ever had. He knows what you're thinking right now. He's seen every up and down, every tear. So just really doesn't matter what the words you say. It matters just a matter of humility that says, God, I need you. That's, that's really it. God, you humble yourself, say, God, I need you. So pray this prayer in your, in your heart, either for the first time or the hundredth time. Dear God, just say that, dear, dear God, I want to live a life of hope. I want to stop drifting. I want to be anchored to your truth. Just say, God, I, I want to anchor my identity in what you say about me, not what everybody else says about me. And God, I, I want to anchor my purpose, my life mission in your purpose for me, why you made me. Help me to learn and understand that. And God, I want to anchor my future, no matter what happens, in your promises to me. So as much as I know how, I'm saying yes to you, Jesus, today. I need you to save me. I certainly can't save myself. And you came to die on the cross for me. So I'm saying yes. Help me to understand it more. I want to learn to love you and follow you and trust you. And I humbly ask this in your name. Amen.